Meanwhile, at the bunker, not having been told to delay the firing, a finger touches the fatal button. <laughs> Although many miles from bomb zero, Dr. Bruce Banner is bathed in the full force of the mysterious gamma rays. The world seems to stand still, trembling on the brink of infinity, as his ear-splitting scream fills the air. This was the dramatic beginning for one of comic books' most popular and unique characters, the Incredible Hulk. Forty years later, the Incredible Hulk is as resilient as the company that created him, Marvel Comics. Owned by publisher Martin Goodman, Marvel was launched in October 1939 under the name of Timely Comics. The first books featured science fiction heroes, the Human Torch and the Submariner. Both characters offered an escape from the country's Depression-era anxieties. Comic books, all in all, are reflection of the times we live in. Especially then, they reflected fears, social economics, wars, and so on. In the wake of Nazi aggression in World War II, Marvel introduced the ultimate superhero, Captain America, in 1941. Later that year, Marvel hired an ambitious 16-year-old high school graduate named Stanley Lieber. Lieber got his first writing assignment on the third issue of Captain America. The passage was entitled, Captain America Foils the Traitor's Revenge. Lieber signed it, Stan Lee. The 1950s proved to be a creatively challenging decade for Marvel due to post-war issues of communism and nuclear weapons. But the 1960s, that was the big time because that's when we came up with characters like the Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, the X-Men, Daredevil, and all the other characters which are now thought of as, as the giants of the Marvel galaxy. After having done our first of the Marvel line of books called the Fantastic Four, I was looking for something else that would be totally different. Then I remembered I had always loved the old movie with Boris Karloff, Frankenstein. And it always seemed to me that the monster played by Karloff wasn't really the bad guy. He was the good guy. He didn't want to hurt anybody. It's just those idiots with torches kept running up and down the mountains, chasing them and getting them angry. <coughs> then I remembered another favorite of mine, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And Dr. Jekyll was a normal man who turned into Mr. Hyde. So I combined Jekyll and Hyde with Frankenstein, and I got myself the monster I wanted, who was really good, but nobody knew it. And he was also somebody who could change from a normal man into the monster. May 1962 marked the release of Lee's monster, the Incredible Hulk, and his alter ego, Dr. Bruce Banner. Bruce Banner is a scientist. He's working with gamma research. And our story is about a guy who is harnessing this incredible energy. The important thing with any hero, the reader has to empathize with the hero, has to care about the hero. So when I wanted my normal character, Bruce Banner, to be the hero, and I thought I would let him become the Hulk in a very heroic way. There was going to be a test explosion out in some lonely field. Now, Bruce Banner, conducting the test, saw a teenager named Rick Jones. He heroically ran out into the field, grabbed the kid, tackled him, and threw him down on the ground, and the explosion occurred. And poor Bruce was inundated with all of those gamma rays. Instead of killing him, the explosion left Bruce Banner with superhuman powers. On the surface, it would seem as though the Hulk is a very simplistic character. He's just an angry monster. But there's really so much more to it than that because he still has dim memories of his human self. In a way, he hates Bruce Banner because to him, Bruce Banner represents a weakling, whereas the Hulk is all powerful. So there's that dichotomy within him. And the tragedy of it, that when the Hulk comes down to be Bruce, when you see the carnage around, 
is the guilt of a very decent man who is looking around saying, I should have never let it out. Stan Lee had developed a complex character in every way, from his behavior to his appearance. Well, my first choice was Gray, because he was a monster, he's supposed to be scary, and I figured Gray is kind of a scary color. But there was a problem. When the book was printed, the printer was having trouble keeping the color consistent. So I decided, in my infinite wisdom, I'll change his color. And I looked around and tried to think what color is no superhero wearing at that time. And I figured green. Nobody was green that I knew of. So I said, okay, let's color him green. It was as casual as that. After six issues, The Incredible Hulk began to appear in other books, such as The Fantastic Four and Tales to Astonish. As The Incredible Hulk continued to develop a loyal following, Marvel continued to exploit his various personality traits. I stopped writing The Hulk after the first 20 issues. Now, after that, Many, many other writers and artists did the strip. So over the years, the Hulk has changed. In some stories, he suddenly became very intelligent. You know, when I had done him, he, he could hardly speak. So he's been done in every way you could imagine. Doc Bruce Banner, belted by Gamma Rays, turned into the Hulk. In 1966, The Incredible Hulk found his way to television as one of the stars of the animated series, The Marvel Superheroes. There's almost nobody anywhere in the world who doesn't remember The Incredible Hulk, played by Lou Ferrigno and Bill Bixby. At one scene, men and women, children, they would cheer when that scene would start. Meaning how his pants stayed on. We cheated, we took the cowardly way out. We, he was wearing long pants. When he became the Hulk, we made the pants shorter. So, you know, his legs would just burst through and we hoped that too many people wouldn't notice. As in the comic book, the television series looked at Banner's turmoil, his internal rage, and his continuous search for inner peace. It does give him the opportunity to know that he has a way to stop evil and do get involved in situations and just try and be a decent guy was always the fear that he may erupt and go over the top. In 1982, after five seasons, the Incredible Hulk series was canceled by CBS. Stan Lee's enduring character had dominated the comics, Saturday morning cartoons, and primetime television. The only medium left to conquer was the big screen. The long-awaited universal feature film about the Incredible Hulk has been the most anticipated appearance of the superhero in decades. You're gonna have to watch that temper of yours. I feel like I have been researching to bring the Hulk to life for years. The great thing about everyone at Universal is that they didn't just want to make an action film. They wanted to make a film that explored character and drama and emotion. Because Stan Lee and Avi Arad were involved from the inception of the project through to the production and, and post-production of, of the film, there has been a great deal of awareness of what it is that the fans relate to in the hall. And we have been very, very careful of keeping true to what it is that makes Hulk great. For the producers and writers, making The Incredible Hulk innovative meant implementing the latest developments in filmmaking wizardry. Without the advances in technology, we couldn't have made the movie the way it will be. So we had people helping us imagine what the Hulk would look like. Then we had great artists building sculptures, clay maquettes. Now this is uh, pretty much a CG model from the sculpt. And from there, the geniuses at ILM scanned those maquettes into their computers and started the enormous and laborious work. We were able to 
create a human creature, an organic creature with skin, with hair, with eyes, with tears, with sweat. Everything that a human being, good or bad, is now in this creature. So it's no longer a maquette brought to life. It's living, it's breathing, it's moving, it's falling, it's hurting. The merging of the film's technology with the performances of his cast was the challenge for director Ang Lee. I think it's time to bring a sophistication in public entertainment in the computer world. Uh, so you can invest your emotion into it, not just watching a creature go crazy, where in the back of your head you know that they're, they're, they're CGI's. Uh, I, I want to see if I can break that barrier. And also it's a challenge to make him and I make Bruce Banner and the Hulk as one person instead of like the comic or the TV series, the two actors or two different entities. And Ang Lee was at the top of the list, and he was at the top of the list because of his body of work. He never seems to do the same thing twice. And it's the humanity in every one of his films that really spoke to us. In the film, Lee stays true to the original themes of the Hulk's humanness and Bruce Banner's cutting-edge work in nuclear science. Of course, we're going we're gonna to do gamma radiation, but I think Ang wanted something that went a little beyond that. In the 50s, of course, radiation was enough to create everything from, you know, giant ants to, you know, uh, I don't know, murderous cereal flakes or who knows what. It was the explanation that worked no matter what you needed. But uh, I think Ang thought that uh, you needed a little more. We're doing a contemporary piece, so we have to upgrade that. We still reserve the gamma exposure, but the gamma is, is more of a control factor to their experiment on this nanomat, those little molecular machines that does the curing and everything. So it's the two put together that unleash what's in there. The very first thing that they wanted me to do was to come up with a kind of self-consistent explanation for the research that the scientist characters in the film were pursuing that would then lead to the accident that creates the Hulk. Uh, Ang very much wanted to know what would make a Hulk and very specifically what happens is that the, the little nanomeds as we've been calling them go haywire in Bruce's body they don't maintain an even balance between destroying damaged cells and replicating good ones so it's a kind of organized cancer in a way in the sense that they maintain the existing structure and so you get a bigger and bigger and bigger guy a Hulk guy in the film, Ang Lee uses the work of David and Bruce Banner as a metaphor for the difficult relationship between father and son. Dad's working on super immune systems, uh, human bodies that are capable of withstanding more, rejecting more, uh, not being infected uh, as easily. The son is working on the same kind of thing, but with a very modern kind of bend. He's trying to devise these little micro-mechanical U-boats, really, that are injected into the body and that swim around and repair damaged cells. So I think that, that kind of collision between those two generations of science is very interesting. The popularity of Stan Lee's complicated character, The Incredible Hulk, is as strong today as it was when it first appeared in 1962. It's one of these characters that you walk in the street, you show someone a picture, say, what's that? And they look at it and say, Hulk. You know that this is a Hulk, and the Hulk is big, as mad, as raging, as everything, is the good guy. And that's great to have this giant, incredible ball of energy that is on the side of right. I never imagined 40 years ago that I would be sitting and being interviewed and talking about this character and the fact that it would be the subject of a major motion picture, the fact that it would still be more popular than ever 40 years later. No, I, I wouldn't have imagined that in a million years.